We're talking about exploring what it means to be on mission with God and for God. This is our church-wide ministry emphasis for this program year, as established by the Board of Elders. And so we're looking scripturally between now and uh, the start of Advent. Uh, what can we pull from Scripture to help us understand what this means to be a people on mission for God? And last week, we began by taking a look at Isaiah's vision of the peaceable kingdom. And if you were here, you may remember that as part of that sermon, I used an illustration, an example uh, of a bakery in New York that uh, decided they were going to uh, have an open hiring policy. If you apply for a job and they have an opening, you get the job. No background check, no resume, no interview. And this company is starting something of a movement because of what they have seen happen to people that they're willing to take a chance on, how people have grown into the job, people they probably never would have hired if they had gone through a traditional hiring process. And so last Sunday after the service, some, one of you came up to me and asked me, is the founder, the owner of that bakery a Christian? I th it would make sense if they were. And you're right, it would make sense. Given the Lord that we profess, given the commandments and instructions, the calling we have received from our Lord Christ Jesus, it would make absolute sense if this bakery were founded by a Christian. But no, this bakery was founded by a Zen Buddhist. It still doesn't mean we have things to learn. But it got me to thinking, when we think of a Christian business, what do we think of? Businesses like Grayston Bakery in New York that has, this, that has innovated and pioneered this opening hiring practice, that's typically not what we think of. We think of companies that have a fish embedded somewhere in their logo or maybe closed on Sundays, or offer Bible studies to their employees. There are a few kind of in, in the Grayston orbit. There's a Catholic in Los Angeles named uh, Father Greg Boyle who started a company called Homeboy Industries, whose mission is to employ and help rehabilitate gang members in Los Angeles. Wonderful, wonderful work this company has, has, has accomplished. But people like Father Boyle tend to be the exception rather than the rule. And I think the prophet Isaiah is here to tell us this morning that there's a problem with that. That there should be a lot more businesses like Grayston. But when we think of what does a Christian corporation look like? What does a Christian business look like? What do Christian businessmen and women, how do we live and work in the world? We ought to be more like this Zen Buddhist. Not that having a fish in our logo is wrong. Not that offering Bible study is wrong. Not that being closed on Sunday is wrong. It's all well and good. But I think the prophet Isaiah would tell us it's not nearly enough. So why don't we go further? Why aren't Christians known as being pioneers of these kinds of things more readily and more particularly in the world? Well, part of it goes back to the Enlightenment. And we, in North America, as part of the Western world, we are all heirs of the Enlightenment. And in the Enlightenment, one of the things that happened was that 
religion and faith got separated from the public sphere. Religion came to be thought of as a private matter, something that you did in the home, not something that you did so much out in public. Or when you did do it in public, you came to a place like this, a church, a place dedicated to that kind of activity that was then acted out, was given voice to through ceremony and ritual. Spirituality became something that we associated with the inward life. And Old Testament scholar Walter Brueggemann says we could even see this, this tension playing out within the pages of Scripture. For us, it goes back particularly to the Enlightenment, but it's, it goes back further than that, actually, to back to the ancient life of ancient Israel in their experience as a nation, as a kingdom, as a people of God. If we look at Leviticus and we look at Deuteronomy, you can see different ways in which the life lived in God is played out. Sometimes it's more personal, more private. Sometimes it's more public. And if you think about the arc of Israel's story, it makes sense. When they were a nation, they could do all kinds of things in public. When they were a people living in exile, not so much. So how they practiced their faith, how they lived their, cha- their faith had to adapt. How they interpreted teachings and commandments had to adapt to their circumstances. This is also a division, though, that we can see not just in the story of Scripture, but in the way that our English Bibles are translated, especially in the Old Testament. We see two words, righteousness and justice. And of course, as English speakers, we interpret those two words a little bit differently. Righteousness is something I would, be, I would imagine most of us think of as, as a personal quality, a personal pursuit, something to do with our individual life lived in faith. Justice, on the other hand, is something that we think of as being more public, more structural, more systemic, something more in the public sphere. But the Hebrew word that underlies those translations means both of those things at the same time. It's not an either or, it's a both and. Rightness would be a, perhaps a better English translation. That which is right, both in relation to God and in relation to each other, in our personal lives and in our public lives, that which is right. And of course, this is, a, this is an idea, this is a thought that Jesus and the apostles not only carry forward, but highlight, that emphasize to us. What is the greatest commandment that Jesus gave to us? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. That's an inward, personal journey, quest. And love your neighbor as yourself, which is an outward, public day-to-day, week-to-week, month-to-month pursuit. And it's two parts to the same commandment. We can't really do one without doing the other. And the first epistle of John really drives this point home and is quite explicit and blunt. First John says, if you say you love the Lord but you do not love your brother or sister, you are a liar. We cannot love God and not love other people. And we could look elsewhere in Scripture, too, for ways in which the apostles challenge 
the earliest churches, about not falling into the patterns of the world, not in their life together and in their worship, not allowing these worldly patterns, these worldly systems to affect how they do things. James chastises the church for offering the best to those who are rich while wanting to keep the poor, the beggars, off to the side, out of sight and out of mind. It's not how we can do things as the people of God. Each Sunday when we celebrate communion, I recite words from the Apostle Paul from 1 Corinthians chapter 11. But, Apostle, but the Apostle Paul gave those words to the church while chastising them for not observing communion properly because the rich were showing up and eating everything and having a grand feast and everybody else was showing up later and didn't have anything. It is not how we, the church, the people of God, the people of Jesus, that is not how we can do things. Our worship of God is not separate from how we relate to other people. And this is really the point that the prophet Isaiah is driving home in the 58th chapter of this book. And let's make no mistake, when the prophet Isaiah is speaking these words, the prophet is speaking to people just like you and I, speaking to the faithful, those who Seek me, the prophet speaking on behalf of God, those who seek me day by day and delight to know my ways, those who ask me for decisions, those who delight in coming near to God. That's what we're all here for this morning, right? People who are earnest enough in their faith, in their worship of God, to fast. And yet the prophet says, the fasting that you're doing isn't really fasting. Because you're fasting on the holy day, and you're still exploiting your workers every other day. That's not the kind of fast that I, the Lord your God, have chosen. That's not what I mean for you to be doing, for you to be seeing it this way. And Isaiah is speaking to worshipers of God who are affluent enough and successful enough to have workers underneath them, either working for them or under their supervision. So the prophet is speaking to people like a good many of us on a few different levels here. And the prophet Isaiah is challenging this inward-outward, public-private kind of dichotomy that we have set up. And not just us, many generations of believers before us as well. If you fast, the prophet is saying, yet you don't treat your workers right, your fast is bogus. If you undertake spiritual disciplines, but you're not treating your brothers and sisters, you're trying to love God but not love your neighbor, your spiritual disciplines are worthless. And I know that's hard to hear. It's hard for me to hear. This is a very challenging chapter, which is why it's not preached on a lot. When Dan was reading, you probably weren't going, yes! (laughs) I'm excited now. not something that we really want to hear, but it's something we need to hear because we're human 
And because we're human, we, it is our tendency to want to have our cake and eat it too. Because we're human, we want to have cake when what God, what Jesus is offering us is bread, the bread of life at the table of forgiveness and love. But the prophet has these challenging words for us, for the people of God, for the people of Jesus, because how we live Monday through Saturday, how we work, how we live in our neighborhoods, how we live in our families is part and parcel with our worship on Sundays. They are two sides to the same coin. And we can't do one without the other. Sunday is very much connected to Monday through Saturday, and Monday through Saturday is very much connected to Sunday for us. And this is where Isaiah 58 connects to mission. What the prophet has to say to us intersects with Isaiah's vision of the peaceable kingdom. Taking Isaiah's words here seriously, as the people of God, as the people of Jesus, is connected to realizing this vision of the peaceable kingdom. And just like that vision that we talked about last week, wrestling with these words, really diving into this text, takes both determination and imagination. Are we able to envision living a life as the people of God that takes what Isaiah chapter 58 says seriously? What would that look like? Well, dream with me for a bit. How does the world outside these walls teach us to judge ourselves? We could make a long list, but let's keep it simple. Let's, let's keep it at three. What we drive, where we live, what we wear. How about that? Those are benchmarks that the world sets for whether we're somebody or not. What do we drive? I have been in some churches, the parking lot has been so full of Mercedes, you'd think that three-point star is a mark of the Trinity. That symbol could be, couldn't really be further from the Trinity. It has nothing to do with the ways of heaven, it has everything to do with the ways of the world. When you buy that kind of car, and I'm not just picking on Mercedes here, I'm picking on any kind of luxury automobile. When you buy that kind of car, you're buying an image. You're buying a brand. You're buying a place on the pecking order of society that says, look at me, I am successful enough to drive this car. Now, what if every follower of Jesus Christ who could afford to buy a Mercedes instead bought a Honda? Good quality car, very dependable. They're always among the highest rated automobiles. <laughs> what if every disciple of Christ Jesus who could afford to buy a Mercedes bought a Honda instead and took the difference because you were going to buy the Mercedes anyway? What if we took the difference and started a scholarship, gave the money to a homeless shelter? started a community garden. We could go on and on and on. Think of the resources that would free up.
if we looked at this measuring stick that the world presents to us and say, and say back, I do not need that hood ornament to be somebody. That's not where my identity lies. We'd find we have a lot more money to use for ministry, I would imagine. I think I've told you about my friend Mark before, my best friend from seminary. He's on my mind because I talked to him yesterday for the first time in a year. Mark was born with a silver spoon in his mouth, and he works in corporate finance. He spends his Monday through Saturday in the boardrooms of Atlanta and London and New York and wherever around the world they send him. He could drive any car he wanted to. When we were in seminary, he drove a 1993 Subaru Legacy, the kind that still had the seat belts that when you shut the door and cranked it up, they slid up around you. Remember those? Did you guys have those up here? <laughs> there were people in his office who would not ride with him in that car. because it was beneath them. And he said, fine. <laughs> I'll ride with you. <laughs> if you won't ride with me. And it opened up topics of conversation for them, for him to talk to them about why he didn't drive the same kind of car they did. As a person of faith, And because he drove that kind of car, there were several students in our seminary class that fell on hard times. He was able to pay their rent for them. He was able to support them and do things for them when they needed somebody to do that because he hadn't spent his money on a fancy car. And he became someone that the people of our seminary, the people in his office, seek out for advice and counsel because there's gravity to the faith that he talks about, because it's backed up by decisions he makes. We could close the same way. When we buy this brand or that brand, we're, we're, we're buying an emblem, we're buying an image. It's been a personal part of my own spiritual journey that I try my hardest. Not that I don't like to, you know, wear clothes that fit right and, and look good and are comfortable, but I, I try my best not to buy anything emblazoned with some big image because I don't want to be a billboard for corporate North America. That's not who my life should represent. That's not what I want people to think about when they look at me. And because I'm usually walking around wearing a plain T-shirt and a plain pair of jeans, they probably don't think much, but that's okay. That's not where my identity lies. My identity is in Christ, not in Ralph Lauren or Tommy Hilfiger or go down the list. Where we live. It's an especially pertinent question given the housing market in Toronto these days. People are leveraging everything they've got and more because the world has taught them that they need to buy a house because that's how they're going to be, have financial security in the future. Even at these outrageous, insane prices. The prices remain outrageous because people are willing to pay them. There was a church in Texas, I believe it was in Waco. It was... Uh, pastored by a woman who later came to Atlanta. And one of the things that happened there while she was the pastor of this church, it was like many churches in America. It had been founded decades ago. Originally, it was a neighborhood church. But then the neighborhood changed, and so it became a commuter church. People drove in from miles away from the suburbs back to this church. But as they studied Scripture together, as they talked about God's calling upon them as Christians, what does it mean to live out our faith during the week? It occurred to some of the people, 
Why are we paying all this money for these houses out in the suburbs? What does Jesus have to do with that decision that we made? And what happened organically as they prayed and as they did the work of faith together is that some families decided, we're going to move back near the church. Not simply as a cost-saving measure, not simply to save us time as commuters, but because this is a neighborhood that needs the love and grace and mercy of Christ Jesus. Now, it wasn't the worst neighborhood in the city or anything, but it was not the trendy spot. It was not the hip place to be. But as these families moved back in and intentionally set about to live their lives there in the neighborhood around their church, the neighborhood began to change in positive ways because they had chosen as people of faith to come back and to take their Monday through Saturday life as believers seriously, simply trying to be good neighbors. Love your neighbor as yourself. And that neighborhood quickly became a much better and more beautiful place. Not because they had an agenda or because they were trying to do something, but for the same reason that your garden is beautiful in the spring because there are flowers there. They're just being flowers And because they are being fully what they are, there is beauty and color and life. That's who we're called to be as the people of God, as the people of Jesus. The world, Isaiah says, I believe, the world should be a more just, more humane, more loving, more hopeful place simply because we are out in it. Being the people that Jesus called us and created us to be as people seeking to love God with our full selves and love our neighbors as ourselves. No other agenda required. If we do that, there will be beauty and hope and love, and we'll get closer to, that, to realizing that vision of the peaceable kingdom. The economy of the kingdom of heaven is different And I think when we think about it that way, it helps, helps us get a fuller sense of what Christ, what the prophet, what God is calling us to be about as the people of Jesus. Is it hard to hear? Yes. Does it make demands of us? Yes. To live against the grain of the world is a fast, the kind of fast that God calls us to, because choosing to do that which is right, to live a life in pursuit of rightness, means that, yes, we may not have everything for ourselves that we see lots of other people having for themselves. But the world isn't our measuring stick. And it's not something that's a chore or something that's miserable or something that we have to suffer through. We not only have to pay attention to what the prophet says about what a proper fast looks like, loosening the bonds of injustice, loosening yokes of every kind, of feeding the hungry, of clothing the naked. We also have to look at the end of what the prophet has to say. If you live this kind of 360 degree faith then your light will break out like the dawn and the Lord will continually guide you and satisfy your desire in scorched places and give you strength to your bones and you will be like a watered garden and like a spring of water whose waters do not fail that's who God's called us and created us to be a source of light, an example of beauty and hope and love. And if that's 
That's what we're striving for. We'll never have to ask questions about how do we remain relevant. Springs of water are always relevant in a thirsty world. Lush gardens of beauty and plenty are always relevant in a scorched and parched landscape. That is who we're called to be. So as we strive to go forward together as brothers and sisters in Christ, as Kingsway Baptist Church, as we seek, like Joe, to follow God's leading, may we take the words of Isaiah 58 seriously and think about what it means to be worshipers Monday through Saturday and not just on Sunday. Thanks be to God for the challenge and the privilege and the blessing. Amen.